Okay, so my name is Sarah, and I'm a, a Peace Corps volunteer right now in Macedonia, which is to the north of Greece. It's a tiny little country. I'll talk more about it in a little bit. These are the three goals of Peace Corps overall, not just Macedonia, but the entire international program. What? The first goal is to help the people of, of interested countries in meeting their need for trained men and women. So there are a bunch of different sectors and a bunch of different jobs that I'll talk about in a second. And then goal two is to help promote a better understanding of Americans on the part of the people served. So that's kind of the part where we're supposed to take our culture and give it to them. Um, just to kind of help them understand Americans because they see us as all these people in Hollywood and movie stars and athletes, and we get asked all the time, you know, do you know Michael Jordan? Do you know Barack Obama? And I'm just like, no, we don't actually know those people, but we live in the same country. And then the third goal is to help promote a better understanding of other peoples on the part of Americans. So that's kind of this whole process of I take, I take Macedonia and I bring it back to America with me to help people understand Macedonians. Like I said, it's a really small country. Most people don't even know. I didn't know where it was when I got my Peace Corps assignment. And I went to Google and I was like, all right, where am I going to live for two years? Um, the History of Peace Corps, it was established by JFK in 1961. And they've been, they've been putting volunteers across the world since then. And the total number of volunteers to date is 215,000. But there's not quite as many active right now. And, the, and then the number of countries served is 139 with 65 currently active and what that means is after after Peace Corps has been there for so long there's kind of no no more need for them so you know we get out and go to a different country that's kind of the goal it's to be the goal is to be kicked out of the country because they don't need you anymore so um, the newest country is Kosovo which is right north of Macedonia they just opened up their first program there a few weeks ago they had a few volunteers from Macedonia go help train them these are the regions of service. As you can see, it's kind of spread out. Most volunteers end up getting put in Africa or South America, which is what I expected, and then I got put in Eastern Europe, which is completely different. Not that I'm sad, because I have running water and electricity, so I have plenty to be happy about. Um, the newest one, I believe, are the Asian countries, because China finally let them bring in the teachers. That was it. sectors of the Peace Corps, so the different departments that they put volunteers. There's the education sector, which is definitely the largest. That's what I'm in. We teach English normally. Occasionally it'll be more like instructional um, strategies and those things, but usually they're in the classrooms directly teaching English. And then youth development, which Macedonia does not have, um, but they work with like NGOs that are geared specifically toward the youth in the countries. Um, YMCA, I found out, is actually all over the world. There's a YMCA in Macedonia, um, and that's usually a big youth development. Uh, the health sector is the second largest. Um, that is mostly in Africa and South America. Macedonia had one, but they found there was no more need for it, because Ma Macedonia's health, health department is pretty, pretty developed at this point. And the community and economic development, that is the other sector in Macedonia. This is kind of like the category that they put everyone that they don't fit anywhere else. So you work with a variety of charities and NGOs. Um, a lot of them work with like organizations that partner with other countries to kind of help help promote friendship amongst these countries because the Balkans are very, very war-torn area. So a lot of them work with like Croatia, Greece, Bulgaria, and Albania. So just to kind of promote interactions between the two different cultures. Agriculture, um, which is mostly in South America, that's kind of one that anyone can get put in and you can have no idea what you're doing. You could be planting you know, fields or building, <laughs> building trees or anything, but um, that one is not in Macedonia, it's mostly in South America. And then the environment is the new one that they are trying to push. A lot of countries aren't quite buying into it yet. I mean, it's kind of a new thing here even. Uh, we have one volunteer in Macedonia that did get put in a new like environmental organization in the capital. It's called like Go Green or something. But that is the first like environmental agency that's ever been recognized by the government. So it's a completely new field.
field, but it, it's probably going to be one of the most, um, one of the fastest growing, I expect, at least hopefully. Now we're going to talk about Macedonia, which the official name is the former Yugoslavic Republic of Macedonia. And the reason why this is such a big deal is Greece still claims Macedonia as part of Greece, because there is still a part in Greece that is Macedonia, and at one point all of Macedonia <coughs> was claimed by Greece. So they, they still have a claim to fame to Macedonia because it's where um, Alexander the Great was born, so they kind of want to hold on to that. So there's a big controversy with the name, and right now the EU is, is holding on to the former Yugoslavic Republic of Macedonia. So, but it's a big thing, you know, if you bring it up with Macedonians, you better, you better call it by the right name or they're going to get angry. But, um, so it's a big issue at the moment. The size of Macedonia is it's slightly larger than Vermont, so it's extremely, extremely small. And that's why when we talk about America, they sometimes are, are surprised at how you know large it is and how we get people from you know very different backgrounds because, because America is so large and we grow up in different places. The population is two million, and the majority of that are uh, villages that are surrounding kind of little hub cities. And then there's just villages all over the place. That's where the main population comes from. It's extremely, extremely diverse. Uh, Macedonians make up the biggest part of the country, followed by Albanians, um, Turkish people, the Romani, and the Serbians. And the craziest part about this, for us coming in not speaking anything other than English, is that each group has their own language. So I don't know how it works, but it works somehow. Um, and it's very, it's very uncommon to meet someone who does not speak three or four languages for this reason, because they're all living so close together. Um, Peace Corps right now just teaches Macedonian and Albanian and a small amount of, of Romani if, if you work with, with the Roma population. Um, the religions, most of them are Eastern, Eastern Orthodox or Muslim, um, which does create a lot of tension in, in the country. In 2001, there was a lot of ethnic tensions going throughout the entire country between Macedonians and Albanians. Most of it was, um, most of it was you know, targeted by religion. Um, and that was the last time that Peace Corps had to close the program and get out, but then they came back. Um, so right now, that is the biggest cause of tension because they're two very, very different cultures. So that creates a lot of problems. The government is a parliamentary democracy. It's kind of structured a lot like our government. It just doesn't quite operate in the same way. And in 1991, Macedonia gained its, its independence from the Yugoslav Republic. Um, it was one of the last countries to do so. And I, I, I like to describe it as America in the 1950s or 60s. So if you look at it in like a social perspective, even, even political or economic, it is kind of America in the 1950s and 60s. One of the stories I like to use is in my, in my last village, which was a very small Albanian village, they have, they have very, very traditional kind of customs and norms. And one of those is that women are not allowed to go into the cafes that are, are designated for men. So I was at school one day, and my director, who was this very nice guy, I and mean, he could do basically anything that I asked. He was a super awesome coworker, and he just wanted to go out for coffee after after school. That's kind of what people do; they go out for coffee afterwards. And he realized, like, we're walking to the cafe, and he realizes, like, oh, she can't go in that cafe. She's a woman. So he's like, all right, what do we do? And <laughs> instead of me walking into the cafe, he has the guys that work in the cafe carry tables outside on the road and we have coffee on the road. You know, as, as an American, I was like, this is crazy. It'd be much easier for me to walk inside the cafe than for all of you to, you know, turn tables and take them outside and sit them on the road. But that's how I like to kind of describe it um, in, a, in, a social, in a social perspective coming from America, maybe about the 1950s or 60s. But then it looks very developed and crazy. This is a map of Macedonia. It's very small. Greece is on the south, and Albania is on the west, which is why most of the Albanian population kind of goes through the western portion of the country. Um, this is an older map, because now Kosovo has split from Serbia. But right now I am living in Kumanovo, which is fancy, fancy technology, which is, a, I think it's the fourth largest city in Macedonia. So I moved there about two months ago, and my life has gotten so much easier being in a city than a village. Uh, my first site was 
a tiny village between Skopje, which is the capital, and Kumanovo. And that was my, my training village, so I was there with 10 other Americans. And they put us all in families. Five of us were with Macedonian families, and five of us were with Albanian families. And all we had for three months was language classes every day for like six hours, which, I mean, it was crazy at the time, but it was definitely necessary. And then we would go home and live with our families, and you practice, like you practice the language, and slowly you start to develop it. Um, we also had cultural training. Just they were, they were mostly just sessions ran by older volunteers, um, volunteers who'd been in the country for a year or two years, just to kind of help prepare us for here are the things you might see that would be different than what you're used to. And then we also had um, technical training, so all the teachers would get together and talk about um, teaching in Macedonia and how it's different from teaching in America. So that was our training spot. And then after two and a half months, we had swearing in, and they kind of sent us off to our different spots throughout the country. And I got placed in a village outside of Struga, which Struga is right on the lake there. It's one of the, it's, I, I think it's one of the most beautiful cities in Macedonia. But I was in a tiny little village there, so I worked there for four months, I believe, in a completely Albanian school. And then they moved me to another Albanian village outside of Tetovo. So I've kind of covered Macedonia here. Um, and I worked there for four months. It was also an Albanian village, so I lived with Albanians, I worked with Albanians, all I spoke was Albanian. And then they decided to move me back to Kumanovo, where I live with Macedonians and work with Macedonians. So now I'm attempting to learn Macedonian, you know, much more in depth than I did in training. So that's kind of the areas where I've covered, but they have volunteers literally in every, every city and villages outside of those cities. I think there's a total of like 90 of us in the whole country, so you don't have to go very far to find another American. The living conditions, this is what I get asked about the most, which it's really not that different from here. I, again, when I got my invitation to go to Eastern Europe, I was extremely excited because I was like, yes, you know, I'm going to have running water, electricity. You know, occasionally those go out, but not, not near as much as what people would think. Um, like I said, I have water and electricity and internet. Internet can kind of be hit and miss. I think I went, the longest was like two and a half months without internet. But, and that was just because the family I was with did not have it. I could still go to cafes in the cities and use their internet. So I mean, I could talk to my family. It wasn't a big deal. Um, and then we, we all live with homestay families. That has recently changed since I came back here to visit. I got, I got many emails when I got back because people were really excited that now they're letting people live in, apartment, in apartments, which, I mean, it's great to live with a family at the beginning because you do learn the language. And that is the only way you're going to learn it, is just kind of throw yourself in there to make mistakes, make, make a fool of yourself and have a bunch of people laugh at you. But you do learn that way. Um, so, I mean, it is, it's very difficult living in a homestay family when you come from a completely different culture. You have no idea what's going on. You can't really talk to these people at the beginning. Um, it was harder for most of us who got put in Albanian families because we were all young women. Uh, most families don't want to take men into their house, but we were young women, so we automatically get treated like, like the oldest daughter. And in, in Albanian, um, in their, I don't know how to say it, part of their culture, is the, the oldest daughter kind of is the servant of the family. You take care of everyone, you do all these things. And you know, yes, we're supposed to kind of embrace their culture, but at the same time, you're supposed to show them yours. So there were there were a few moments where it was just like, all right, am I actually gonna do this? Who's gonna who's gonna win this battle here? Am I gonna serve you coffee or are you gonna do it yourself? <laughs> so we had a few of those moments, but these are a few pictures. This is another volunteer and her family, and they made they made baklava for for Little Byron, I believe, which is a Muslim holiday. And so I mean, it is really cool because you get to see those things. Like that's something that we would never see. You don't watch people make baklava here in America. <laughs> so those are the cool things about being in a homestay family. And these, uh, th this is a homestay family in my training community. They were both Macedonian, and I spent a lot of time at their house so I could practice Macedonian as well as Albanian. They were super, super awesome people. And this was kind of their outside, which I was really impressed because this family was completely self-sustainable. Like, they bought nothing. They completely lived off their land. They did their own thing. And uh, that was just so foreign of a concept to us. Like, are you kidding? We don't do that. <laughs> like, we have to go buy everything that we need. But they had everything on their land. They just completely lived off of it, which I, I was just super impressed. I would just sit there and watch them all day. Like, what are they going to do next? 
Um, so what am I doing specifically? I am part of the, of the education sector, so we teach English as a foreign language to students in Macedonia. And there are kind of three different parts of the TEFL program. The first one, and we kind of like to make that our main goal, is a um, is it's kind of like a transfer of skills from us to our counterparts. So the, the teachers that we get paired up with, um, you usually get paired up with like two or three teachers at one school. So you go with them to all their classes. Hopefully you do all the planning with them. So the goal is to kind of help them become better teachers because in two years when you leave, they're the ones going to be teaching the students. So it's great to teach the students and improve their speaking and listening skills, but it's more important to give the teachers those skills where they can do that for the remainder of the student's career. And then resource development and implementation. That's kind of what you think of when you think of Peak Explorer. Like, okay, this volunteer's just going to come in, they're going to do all this stuff for us, they're going to show us how to use it, and they're going to leave. But we kind of like to get away from that. Um, there, there are a few grant programs that we do um, use, but we try to make it more like a skills transfer instead of like, oh, here's all these resources that you can use. But, so we try to focus a lot on like lesson planning is a very new thing in Macedonia. They don't really teach their, their teachers how to lesson plan effectively. Most teachers just walk in and they have the book that's, that's been selected by the Ministry of Education and just opens up and they're like, okay, we'll start here. So that's something that we're all really, really trying to push at the moment because it's so much easier to teach when you have a, have a lesson plan. So that's a, that's a struggle. But um, I've worked in three different schools, like I said earlier. Um, Tateshi was my first village, and then Slatino, and then now in Kamanovo. Um, I've had a very diverse counterpart um, teaching experience. I've had counterparts who have taught in Macedonia for 40 years, and they're getting ready to retire. And then I've had counterparts who are fresh out of, uh, out of university. They're ready to start everything. So it's kind of easier for me to work with them because they're new, they haven't picked up habits. I can kind of help train them, and they're going to use it for the remainder of their career. Towards I kind of had to take a step back with some of the older ones. It was much harder for them to change the way that they've been teaching. You know, they just kind of see me like, oh, here's this young American who's going to come in here and tell me how to do my job. And that's certainly not what I want to do. So, and I actually learned a lot from them because they had been in those situations for 40 years. Um, like I said, lesson planning is our biggest, our biggest push at the moment. They, I think they're required to have some sort of lesson plan by the Ministry of Education in Macedonia but it's very simple. Basically, it's like, what are you teaching today? You know, sign your name because <laughs> you did it. But it's nothing extensive, and we're trying to push, push to have that, as well as assessment. Um, the grading system is a little crazy. Um, at the end of the year, the ministry requires them to write grades for each student in this like famous red book. And basically, the teacher just sits down and they're like, okay, this student's gonna get a five, this student's gonna get a three, which that's their grading scale. Like a five would be an A in our system, a four would be a B, and a three would be a C. So it's kind of just like they kind of go with what they feel the students should get, or I don't know, just based upon how, how often the student came to class or what they did. So we're also trying to introduce them to assessment, how you can use that to make their jobs a lot easier as well. So that's mostly what I've been trying to work on. Um, so teaching is my primary project. But Peace Corps volunteers are always encouraged to have secondary projects as well because we have lots of time. I think the biggest adjustment for me is like the work week is 20 hours a week. Like I only teach for 20 hours. Um, that doesn't include like planning and things like that, but it's not anywhere near what we work here as, as teachers. So I was like, I have all of this time, you know, I can only read so many books. What am I going to do with myself? So we usually try to start different different programs in our villages or in the nearest city. Uh, one of the national uh, projects we did was a spelling bee in English, which was really fun because we all got to have them in our, in our villages or our, our own sites. And we had like local bees. So we had to see, you know, who's going to qualify out of our site. And then we had a regional one. So we brought all the kids from the villages into the nearest city and then they would compete. And then those winners could go to the national one in Skopje which is the capital of Macedonia, for like the big, big spelling bee, so. Which was really cool because often, often the kids in the villages are not going to get to go to the nearest city, let alone the capital. So it was really fun to get on a bus with all these kids who had never been to the capital before, and you know, they're ready to compete. 
So that was, that was, that was my favorite by far. Um, I've had two different book clubs at both of my villages uh, with the advanced 8th grade students, because at this point they're old enough, they, they almost speak English fluently. I'm still amazed at how they can do that when I'm stumbling through my Macedonian. But, so we had different, different, different types of book clubs and different interests. I really enjoyed that though because it was more of an informal environment for me to help, to help teach them. And I feel like I definitely got more out of that. And then I had a girls basketball team in Slotino with 7th and 8th grade girls. And the, the craziest thing about this is, I mean, my, my village was completely Albanian. Young girls are not usually permitted to do anything outside of the home except school. Um, until they reach high school and, and then they stay home. So I had to really, really push to do this. Again, my, my director was super supportive, thankfully, because he was, he was a man in the community. He could go to these homes with me and you know, tell them, like, hey, it's going to be fine. They're going to play basketball for an hour. They'll be back home. So I did have to go to a lot of houses and convince parents, like, not here to you know, brainwash your children. I'm not some crazy American coming in here. But we just wanted to play basketball because um, the school had – a few different teams for, for boys, but there was literally nothing for girls, and there were so many girls who wanted to do it, and they found out that I had played basketball, and it's like all that they wanted to do. I couldn't get them to learn English until we played basketball, so um, that was one of, my, one of my favorite projects. And then English conversation hours, usually with university students and adults, we would normally have these in the cities, and then the volunteers in the villages would kind of come into the city to hold these conversation hours. and. This is partly run by the U.S. Embassy, and we have to we have to be careful about doing these things because we don't want to be associated with the embassy, you know, because that's very political. And Peace Corps tries not to be political. Once you start taking sides, is when people stop wanting your help. So, um, but the embassy would give us like topics each Tuesday. I think they would put out you know things on Facebook and emails like this is what we're going to talk about this week and this week. And they try to find some subject that would relate American culture to Macedonian culture. Um, I think on, on, on like Martin Luther King Jr. Day, we had kind of a topic about racism. So we, we, we talked about it here in America, but we were kind of hoping that it would carry over to you know, what's happening in Macedonia. Because there's definitely a lot of um, ethnic tension still there. So that was kind of like our way of, okay, how can we make this relevant here? And that's one of the only things we do with adults, which is nice, because there are plenty of adults who speak English um, in Macedonia, because they all learn it in school. Um, a, lot of, a lot of adult men have learned English because they get hired by the government to go work in Iraq, and they work with, with our soldiers and, and uh, people who represent our government, so they're forced to learn English, basically, and they come back to Macedonia, and you know, I run into someone on the street who speaks fluent English, and I'm just like, what the, how did this happen? What, what are you doing? But, and then I'm immediately like, hey, you want, can I get your phone number so I can call you? And I'm stuck in a taxi and I can't talk to anyone. <laughs> but, and then um, I'm a part of our, our Gender and Development Committee, which is a committee made up of all of Peace Corps volunteers around the country. Um, and our goal is to kind of help promote things, things like our, our basketball teams for, for young girls who <coughs> don't have the opportunities. Um, right now, one of our biggest projects is to create toolkits for volunteers of, of like things they can do in their in their community um, with the people who live in their community. And, you know, like showing movies and um, different different discussion topics on gender because it really is something that has not quite developed in Macedonia yet. So I definitely enjoy that committee because it is kind of controversial. We we do kind of spark a lot of conversation in the area. So I've recently been moved to a new site in Kamanovo. This is a picture off of my balcony um, from my top floor. And Kamanovo is a huge city, um, and I've talked with my counterparts and a few community members to try to plan different things to do. In August, when I, when I go back, we have a GLOW camp, and GLOW stands for Girls Leading Our World. So it's a camp that is based in Tetovo, and we use the school that was built by Americans um, and we stay there for a week, and we have girls from all over the country, um, very different backgrounds. There'll be Macedonian girls, Albanian, Turkish, Roma, Serbian, a, just a <laughs> crazy amount of girls. And the one rule is you can only speak English, because that is the way that we get these people from different ethnicities to talk to each other. You know, because if you 
if you allow them to speak in their first language, then immediately they're going to go to different groups. The Macedonians are going to go here, the Albanians are going to go here. So by forcing them to only speak in English, they can talk to each other and realize that, hey, we, we are a lot alike. We all live right here in this tiny country. Um, and then I'd like to start a club blow, which um, is just like a weekly club in, in my community. Right now there is not one in Kamanovo, so I'd like to start that. So the girls who go to Camp Glow from Kamanovo can come back and start their own club that meets weekly or bi-weekly and then get other girls interested. So I'd love to do that. Um, and then at, at Camp Glow, we just have fun classes. Um, we usually talk about social issues. And then, of course, we work on English development, um, leadership classes, and then we try to talk about opportunities for higher education because it does not happen often for girls in, in small villages. And then another volunteer and I are going to start an English class with, with the Romani population. And the, the Roma population kind of gets shoved aside quite often. They're kind of this population that has been rejected by every country in the area. So they kind of just go and they have their own little communities. And Kamado actually does have a pretty high Roma population. So we would love to start something with them, teaching them English, because often these kids, they might go to school, they might not. Um, so they're not getting the English, the English education that all the other kids are getting. And then English movie, TV, or music nights. This is the way that people learn English there. It is crazy to me. Um, they definitely get way more out of watching English movies and TV shows than they do coming to English class. So often, if I have like a seventh grader who's fluent, I'm like, all right, what movies do you watch? Because this is not possible. So yeah, they're often more up on pop culture than I am. So this is definitely how they learn English, which is perfectly fine with me. I would much rather watch a movie than have to try to force the verbs into them or something. Um, this is my impact to BKU during my service. I did not see this part coming, but um, I have, I have I've developed two different libraries while I've been in Macedonia. And that's actually the reason that they put me at my first two sites, because they knew that I had experience working in libraries. Um, so I didn't see this part coming, but this was a picture of the first library that was developed in Tateshi. Uh, another, another volunteer who was there before me started, she started kind of developing a library, um, but they had, they had not really continued it since I had been there. So we kind of started to redo it. Um, I, had, I had a counterpart who was really, really instrumental in making this happen. So I was able to um, find books from the Capitol and different things, um, and I would love to extend it. I'm still in contact with the teachers from this school and uh, the Peace Corps does, the Peace Corps has a few grant programs which I would be willing to use um, for, this, for this project because they definitely put in the time and effort and they definitely want to see it continue. Um, and then also like uh, showcasing a variety of uses of the library. Most people, um, most people there, you talk about libraries, and they're like, okay, books. The kids are going to read the books. They'll take them home, they'll bring them back. Um, the teachers were kind of starting to realize that they could use those materials in their classroom to make their lessons a little more exciting for the kids. Um, and then the kids just love it. And they can take books home and bring them back and go home and read their English book to their mom and dad. And, you know, they, they think they're great. So <laughs> I, I really enjoyed working with both the schools I did to develop libraries. I don't know if it'll be something that happens with my next school. My next school is already pretty developed, but we will see. It was something that I did not expect um, going over there. I have all kinds of stories, but I tried to um, make notes so I could re remember some of them. Uh, in training, when we first get there, we're kind of treated like children because we don't speak the language. We have no idea where we are. We have no idea what we're doing. Um, another volunteer, who, who was in language class with me. She came to school one morning and she was just laughing. I was like, what, what's happened now? But her host mother decided to put her shoes on for her before she went to class. <laughs> so these things happen often. They really do treat us like children. And you kind of just have to go with it. Um, my example of that was every morning in, in Slotino, I would have breakfast with my host brother and we would sit there and you know, wait for her mom to come downstairs and then she'd pour our cereal and then we'd pour the milk and you were definitely treated like a toddler, so you kind of just have to take it and deal with it. Some days I was just like, I'm going to make my own coffee. I want to do it, but um, that's just the way it works, so you have to go with it. Um, running, in both of my villages that I've gone running in, it's a very foreign concept to them. They 
women definitely don't go run. You don't exercise. You don't, you don't do that. I mean, most men don't do that. So the first time I went running in my first village, you know, I'm just running down the road. It's like January, so it's cold and I'm bundled up. But I was like, I don't care. I'm going to do it. And the men at the cafes thought something was chasing me. And they thought, <laughs> they thought that I needed help. So they started running after me. And I'm just like, what, what are you doing? I mean, like, I hardly speak Albanian at this point. Like, I can understand a little bit, get my point across. But they just thought I was crazy. Once I was trying to explain to them, like, no, I'm actually doing this because I want to. No one's going to hurt me. I'm fine. But that's always a story I enjoy telling. Because it's just such a foreign concept to them that people would run or exercise. Um, the community hotline. This is what I, I've named like the phone tree in the villages. I would get off the combi, which I'll talk about in a second, which are like vans that transport us throughout the country. I'd get off the combi at like one end of my village, and then I'd have to walk through the village to get to my house. And my house mother would know I was coming before I got there, because the people who lived at the end of the road would call her and be like, your American's on her way. You better open the door, she's coming. You have dinner ready? So everyone knows everything that you're doing all the time. Like, you're constantly being watched. Sometimes it's fun, but other times you're just like, all right, guys, I do this every day. You're going to get used to this one of these days. But no, so it's definitely definitely something that happens. My host mother, I would, I would come home from school. She'd have lunch ready for me because that's what she does. And I could hear her on the phone, like, Sarah's wearing a red shirt. <laughs> She's eating chicken. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't think I could understand her, but I do know some Albanian. But it's just what they do. They talk about the American they think it's crazy that you're there, they don't understand the one thing. They're like, why would you be here when you could be in America? So we get that question often. Um, the combis, the combis are very special. The combis are basically these old vans that no longer have any purpose. And these men decide to get in these combis and transport people in and out of villages. So I would, I would have to ride a combi from my village to get into the nearest city if I wanted to get groceries or if I just wanted to go to a cafe because I couldn't go to the ones in my village. Um, so it, it's a crazy concept, because you go and you stand on the side of the road, and you wait for this old man to pick you up in the van. <laughs> and I was like, in America, this is a bad idea. You don't wait. <laughs> you don't wait to get vans from strangers <laughs> to go into a city. And I would stand there for hours just to go get coffee with another volunteer. Um, I mean, I've never had any problems with any of the coffees. Most of them, the drivers are super excited when they figure out you're American. They're like, what are you doing here? And, um, Albanians are very, very fond of Americans because we did go into Kosovo to help, uh, to help, to help Kosovo gain its, its independence from Serbia um, in the 90s. So they automatically think like all Americans have saved us. So um, I'm just like, all right, I didn't actually have anything to do with that, but I'll let you give me free food if you want. Um, or they'll give me free rides if they find out I'm a teacher or something. But I, I currently don't have to deal with combis because I'm in a city now, so let's hope that stays that way because I'm tired of waiting for vans on the side of the roads. Uh, the chickens, this was amazing. In my, my training village, the chickens are just everywhere, all the time. It doesn't matter, like, any yard, any road. But then the most amazing part is they all go back home at night. Like, how do you know whose chickens are whose? I don't, like, they just they go all over the place. I don't understand how you know whose chickens are whose, but... Um, in one of my villages, I lived in this really nice house. My family, my family had lots of money. Uh, it was an incredibly nice house, a nicer house than I've ever lived in in my entire life. Um, and I, I don't know what happened, but no one was home. And I got up, um, I, got, I got up to get ready for school. And I'm walking downstairs, and there's this chicken in the house, and it just like runs across, you know, the walkway. And I'm just like, okay, that's definitely not supposed to be here. Albanians are extremely clean. Um, you can't wear shoes in the house. They definitely don't have indoor pets, you know, nothing like that. So I was like, all right, if my house mother knew this chicken was here, she would be, you know, causing all kinds of, all kinds of <laughs> activities to happen. Um, so I'm trying to get this chicken out of the house, and I'm basically trying to, you know, open up every door to get it to leave, and I finally got it to leave. And then the next day, the chicken is back again. And this time my little host brother is there, who's eight. And I was like, all right, you left the door open, didn't you? And he's like, yeah, don't tell mom. So we're trying to like get this chicken to leave the house, and this is a very common thing, apparently. One volunteer had a cow in the house. I'm glad that mine was only a chicken. I don't even know what I'd do with that, but um, I have so many stories. I could go on forever. These are some pictures. This was my training village.
called Romanovse, and it was multi-ethnic. They chose this village to train us because it was completely 50% Albanian, 50% Macedonian, which is rare, but that's where they wanted to put us so we would get both cultures and both languages. That's, it. that's my training group over there. There were 10 of us who were in one village, so it was nice when you're going through all these different experiences to be able to you know, walk, walk for a few minutes and find another American to speak English to and just be like, oh my God, guess what happened to me today? You know, someone put my shoes on for me. Like, that's something you want to tell somebody. Uh, so it's nice to be able to talk to other Americans. This was my, uh, my school where we had language class. There were two tiny little rooms and they split us up uh, because there was, there was no room for all of us to be in a classroom. So we had two different teachers. We had an Albanian teacher and a Macedonian teacher. They were both wonderful. Um, and then this is a picture. Uh, we were playing soccer with Kelly's little host brother here. He thought it was awesome because he had 10 Americans to play with him. Uh, that happened quite often. This is the cow that would just walk randomly down my street in training. We became well acquainted. Um, and this is a picture of me with my first host family, my first host family, my training family. It was my little host sister who was eight. She was a big part of my language development. Because she was so bored, she would sit there and wait for me to figure out what I was going to say. Um, peppers are all over the place. This is one of my favorite things about Macedonia because I love peppers and they're just everywhere. They actually take the red ones and kind of grind them up and make this like pepper spread called Ivar, which is all, all over the country. I love it. I brought some back for my family to try. They weren't quite as crazy about them as I am. I will all get them eventually. This is a picture from swearing in. After uh, two and a half months of training, we have this official like swearing in ceremony. That's when your, your actual service starts. So from that day, you have two years. Uh, it was in some, some building in, in Skopje in the capital. We had like the American ambassador come, the Macedonian president. It was this big, big deal, and then we had to we had to learn the the Macedonian national anthem, and they made us all sing this national anthem. So it was it was disastrous. Luckily, they had the crowd sing with us because we had no idea what we were doing. Uh, we could hardly speak Macedonian at this point. Uh, the second picture was taken at a wedding. It was it was an Albanian wedding in a tiny little village uh, where where. Another volunteer lives, and I went to visit her. Um, I've tried to avoid weddings in Macedonia because they are days long, and I don't <laughs> want to do that. But this volunteer, like, I, we, we planned this trip for me to come visit her. You know, I was excited, and then she's like, oh, we're going to a wedding. And I was like, you definitely didn't tell me that until I got off the bus <laughs> for a reason. But um, this one wasn't too bad. I think it lasted like eight hours. Um, it, was, it was crazy. Lots of, lots of like, oro dancing. They dance in a circle. Uh, they, they give money to the bride, and she has like seven dresses. It's a, it's a thing. They, ch they change dresses throughout the service. You know, she'll be there for like 20 minutes, and you see her disappear, and she comes back with another dress. So you're just sitting there like, all right. Um, this, this is Brittany's grandmother, her host grandmother. She's another volunteer. Um, and she's, she's an awesome lady. I love meeting her. She was one of the Albanian women who was very, like, surprisingly, I don't know, modern, and she had like very forward-thinking thoughts for someone who had been only in this tiny Albanian village. So every time I go visit her, I just love it. And she thinks it's funny, and we try to communicate. She's very patient, but she just laughs at us. This was taken in Kosovo. Um, the first weekend that we were allowed to travel outside of country, you know, we all just pack up and go because we're so excited. Macedonia is this tiny little country, and you can get to so many places that you want to go. So this was in Pristina with the Bill Clinton statue. They all idolize him because he went in during the during the Serbian War and helped him gain an independence. Because Kosovo was primarily Albanian, so they were extremely excited to have Americans there. And the hostels we stayed at, we ended up staying at for free because they loved Americans so much, and we could speak Albanian. And they were just so excited to have us. So we'll definitely go back to Kosovo because it's very like modern and very Americanized, is how I called it. You could really kind of see the American impact of it, so we had Mexican food and, you know, real cheeseburgers, and it was very exciting. Um, this one is a ski resort in Macedonia, which we didn't know about until another volunteer who had been there for two years told us, so we just took a weekend and went up there and hung out in one of the cabins. There were three different ski resorts in Macedonia that are actually uh, pretty popular among Europe in, in, the, in the winter. They just come right down and ski forever, because uh, most of Eastern Europe doesn't have that much snow. So um, they would come to Macedonia to ski, and it was a really awesome place. 
Uh, the hiking is definitely crazy throughout the entire country. This was, I think, we hiked from the capital, Scobia, to another city. Um, there's just, and it's completely mountainous. When we first got off of the plane and we were on a bus to go to orientation, and you're kind of looking at it, we kind of described it as like Colorado here. The mountains are just everywhere. Um, it's a very, very beautiful country. Uh, this was, these pictures were taken during Macedonian Easter, so Orthodox Easter, which is a little bit after um, our, our Easter. But they have very similar traditions. You can see the eggs in the basket, which they paint. Um, this was at David's counterpart's house. So David is another volunteer, and his counterpart um, works, I believe, with the, the Croatian Friendship Organization. So his counterpart is half Croatian, half Macedonian, and they work. Um, they kind of work between the two countries to kind of help help keep peace. But so of course we had all kinds of goodies, and we just kind of went to see what what their celebration was like. And it ended up being pretty similar. This is Okrid, which is a city in southern Macedonia. It's probably the most tourist tourist town. This is where everyone comes. Um, it looks very European. Um, there are two volunteers in Okrid, and we always tell them that they're extremely lucky because it's a very beautiful town. Um, but it does have a very uh, very high rate of like prostitution because it is a tourist town. So one of the volunteers who works there works at, at, at an organization um, that's, that's directed uh, toward, toward helping sex workers because it's such a huge industry. And because Oprah is kind of this random town surrounded by very poor villages, young girls get pulled out of there um, and all, they just want to make money. So that's the reason why these floors are in Oakland, even though it looks, it looks so developed and it's kind of visually deceiving. Um, Tetovo, which was the city um, closest to one of my villages, and this is one of the painted mosques that was developed, I believe, in the 16th century. So that was a really cool mosque that we got to go check out. And it was very unusual that we would get to go. Uh, I think they just let us in because we were Americans, but. Um, normally, only men go in there. Um, women can go upstairs, I think, but you have to be completely covered. Um, but I think they just really, they were really excited because we wanted to be there. We wanted to see what was going on. So, and this was a picture right outside the mosque with the Macedonian flag. I'm surprised that there's not an Albanian flag hanging right next to it. Tetovo is, I think, 80% Albanian, but they've started to kind of uh, migrate to the Macedonian ways. Um, this is Slatino, which was my village outside of Tetovo. My house was right down this little road. Um, I wasn't allowed to take pictures of my of my house for security reasons. The security officer at Peace Corps would come here and yell at me. But um, this is what my village looked like. It was a really nice village. And it's not really what you think of when you think village, but this village was extremely developed. A lot of people in my village would work abroad, so they'd just be gone to Switzerland or somewhere like that to work because they get paid a lot more there. And then they come back to Macedonia and they can live off of what they get paid there for years in Macedonia. The cost of living is so low. Um, I think I get I get paid $12 a week and it's plenty, plenty for me to live off there. Um, so it's definitely, it's definitely an opportunity for people to go work abroad and make money. Uh, this is a picture of some of my students at the school. That That is the Albanian flag. It was a completely Albanian village. Um, and this, this village and its surrounding area was definitely the site of the um, Albanian rebellion in, in 2001. And you can definitely still see the effects of that. Um, the school was pretty developed. I really couldn't complain as far as what I had to work with. Some of the, it was one of the nicer schools I've been in, in Macedonia. Um, this was my first village in Tateshi. It was a brand new school. Um, there wasn't a lot inside the school, but they did have a really nice building to start with. And this was kind of an overview of my village. Uh, there were two schools in my village, one at the beginning and one at the end, so I'd have to walk to each of them. In the summer, you know, it's nice to walk, but in the winter it wasn't quite as fun when it's, you know, 20 degrees outside and I have to walk 35 minutes to get to school. So winter, winter is not fun, but summer is much better. This is Struga which I talked about earlier. Uh, this picture was taken during one of the Macedonian holidays. Um, they have this, this tradition where everyone gathers kind of around the, well here, here it's the river, but if it's a lake or a pond or any type of water source, 
in the community. And one of one of the local priests comes out and he has this cross and it's it's usually the young men kind of gather along the bridge and the side of the of the river and he throws the cross in to the river and then everyone runs in to try to get it. And it's some like tradition that you know if you, if you get the cross it would be good luck. So but it's in January, so it's freezing. <laughs> um, it's, it's usually mostly young men. I think one female volunteer did it a few years ago, and then the Peace Corps doctors yelled at her because they were like, come on, you're making terrible decisions, it's freezing. But um, we saw a few women in Struga that decided to do it. And this is just kind of a main walkway in Struga. It's also very touristy because it's right on the lake. We had a training there, and we were all very, very shocked at how nice it was. This is my current city, Kamanabo. Um, it, you can kind of still tell with the architecture, it is very like post-communism era. Uh, that's like the house of culture, I believe. I don't know if anything actually happens there. And this is a view of the city at night from my house. Um, it's a lot of apartment buildings. They have a few universities, so the population's kind of younger. Uh, and then Skopje, which is the capital. Skopje is incredibly nice. So we, we, we first flew into Skopje and they're driving us around and we're just like, whoa, this is definitely not what we thought we were going to experience in Peace Corps. But uh, Skopje is incredibly nice and then you drive 10 minutes outside and it's just village after village after village after village. So then you start to realize why we're there. Um, this is a castle that was left over from when the Ottoman Empire had control of Macedonia. It's one of our favorite places in Macedonia right before I came. Um, Billy Idol came to Macedonia and he performed in the castle, so of course we all had to go. I was more excited about it being in the castle. I would watch anyone perform in a castle. But um, and then this is a statue of Alexander the Great, which Macedonia and Greece are currently fighting over. You know who's he going to belong to? But they're building all kinds of statues of him. Um, and any questions? I don't know. I feel like I could just ramble for hours. How many I'm girls played it. basketball? What? How many girls played basketball? I had 20 7th graders and 10 8th graders. Once once we kind of got a few to sign on, then more started coming. I mean, once you, once you could get a few of the fathers to agree, then they would talk to their friends, and it was kind of, once we just had to get over the initial planning process. But um, I, had, I had a team, and then a girl in a village on the other side of Tetevo had a team, so we were hoping to try to organize some type of event where they could play against each other um, because they were both Albanian. And then there was a volunteer um, in Eastern Macedonia who was in a Macedonian village, and we would love to find a way to get those two teams to play together so that they could see that, you know, hey, we're, we're a lot alike, not, not so different in many ways. But that was, that was a crazy process. I had to go to so many houses and talk to these people in Albania, and they were just like, what are you doing? <laughs> but um, it, was, it was really nice when we got it to actually work out. It was one of my favorite things. It's crazy though. Yes. First of all, I just wanted to thank you for giving such a wonderful uh, presentation. Oh, thank you. Yes. By the way, uh, which office organizes this event? The library? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay, wonderful. Yes. Now, are you going to be here in the fall? No, I will not. Oh, what a shame because yes. I would love uh, for you uh, mm -hmm. to, to talk with uh, our students at EKU. Okay. So we, could, we could set up like a Skype. A Skype session, we could do something like that. A Skype session? Uh-huh. Okay, so you, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Because, uh, um, yeah, it's, um, mm -hmm. I, I, um, I'm unofficially in mm -hmm. charge of uh, the effort to, uh, to, 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 um, to ask our students to apply for prestigious mm -hmm. national and international yes. scholarships and fellowships. Mm -hmm. And even though Peace Corp is something mm -hmm. else, but nonetheless it's closely related yeah. enough. And I think that there's a number of students at EKU recently mm -hmm. who, do, do, uh, do, uh, do you know um, Miles Owens? Not that I know of. He, uh, he was a, uh, gr he graduated from the honors program mm -hmm. for which I work and he's, I think he's currently a Peace Corps uh, volunteer. Oh yeah. Uh, Do you know where he? Fiji, uh, oh, Fiji, Fiji Islands. Oh wow, yeah. yeah. But 
So uh, I presume you were not in the honors program, right? Uh, no, I was Okay, not. so because yeah. otherwise I would have heard about yes. this. Yeah. yeah, no, I was So I, I, I would love to have you, I mean, so in case, mm -hmm. uh, so but Skyping is an option and yes. I should get in touch. Yes, also videotaping, um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, have a, we'll have a link or something that we can give you. If okay, and yes. then I should just get in touch with you yeah. to get yes. your contact. Okay, no, thank absolutely. you for. I, I wouldn't care to talk about the um, application process. Yeah, and things because like that. I, I would love for our students to be aware of this opportunity and, yes. and, and, and you know, and, and if they're interested, uh, apply for. for, for yes. Because I know that EKU students, uh, you know, uh, can become great uh, right. advocates. But uh, one question I have is that what are the most uh, satisfying aspects and the most challenging aspects of your experience okay. as a Peace Corps uh, volunteer? Uh, definitely the most challenging is um, language development. Mm -hmm. Having to learn a completely, completely new language um, and Macedonian and Albanian are very, very different from English and they're also very different languages. So trying to kind of learn both at once and then being put into a site where I only used one, but then you get switched and you have to use the other. So language development is definitely by far the hardest part. Mm -hmm. It takes so much more effort to do simple things like going to the store or even just going to a cafe. Um, you kind of have, you, you always have your brain turned on. It's not so easy just to kind of sit there and talk to someone. Mm -hmm. um, the what most, about the cultural aspects? The cultural aspects? Mm -hmm. um, living with host families for most of us is yeah. extremely challenging. Mm -hmm. Um, because you kind of have to figure out where you fit yeah. in, that, in, in that family dynamic, which is very different from what we're used to. Um, Americans love privacy. You know, families kind of go about doing their own thing. The kids go play, yeah. you know, the parents are sitting there. Like, it's, it's a completely different thing because in Albanian and Macedonian families, they're a very, very tight unit, very tight-knit unit. Um, so it's strange for you to just go in your room and read by yourself. Mm -hmm. Towards That's what Americans kind of do to yeah. de-stress and kind of do our own thing. So it was very, very strange for them to have this American in their house and the American's like, all right, I'm going to bed now. I'm going to go read. And they're just like, why? What are you, what are you doing? Do you not like us? And we're like, whoa, no. So um, the, the privacy concept is definitely a very foreign thing for them to whereas Americans, we definitely value our privacy. Yeah. Um, the most rewarding, I would definitely have to say, is working in the school systems. Yeah. Um, that's kind of like the reason that we're there so that's the reason that we go through dealing with all these other things, you know, like language development and cultural differences. It can be very stressful at times. But then when you go to work, you actually see, you know, okay, there is a reason why I'm doing this, and it's so much easier to do it. Um, Anything related to your gender, whether good things or bad things? Yes. No, I mean, it's been a completely eye-opening experience for me uh, because I was placed with Albanian families at the beginning, and I kind of got to see... It is so different than what I'm used to. Um, even even when families get together, like ex extended families, the men go to one part of the house, the women go to another. Like they're kept completely separate. You know, the women go and they serve tea or coffee or whatever. Um, that's not something I'm used to. Like I, it was very strange for me. Of course, they would they would make allowances for me because I was the American. So, you know, the men would want to talk to me too and. Even though, like, it was fine for me, I could still tell that they were a little uncomfortable, or you know, my host mother was uncomfortable. Um, dress the way that the way that we dress, we had to completely alter. Um, even though in like June, when I would go running, yeah. I would have to run in pants, you know, long sleeve shirt, mm -hmm. um, which was crazy for me. I was like, I don't want to go running in this. But, How's the weather uh, over there in June? It's very hot. Okay. Um, it, it's I like to say it's pretty similar to what we have here, it's just the extremes are more extreme. Mm -hmm. So in the in the summer, it's, it's a little bit more hot, but in the winter, it's a little more cold. Okay. Um, but we have all four seasons. It's very it's very similar to what we, to the, to the climate that we have here. Mm -hmm. Very good, thank you. No, no problem. Any more? Can you explain the application process? Yes, yes. definitely. Um, the first thing you'll do is go online and fill out the very basic application on the Peace Corps um, website. I think you have to talk about um, your work experience, school experience, things like that. Um, then you'll be contacted by a recruiter. My recruiter was based out of Louisville, um, and they will set up an interview process with you. Uh, so you might have to drive there. I don't think there's one in Lexington. I think the only one in Kentucky is Louisville. Um, and if it's too far, they'll do Skype interviews, things like that. 
Um, and that interview is just a chance for them to kind of get to know you more and see if it would work for you. Um, and then your, your recruiter will document the whole interview. They'll put in this document and send it to Washington where they will evaluate your interview. Um, most people who apply will, will eventually get it. It might take a while because the process is very long. Um, after the interview, if you do get an invitation to go to a country, you have to go through medical um, evaluations, which take forever. You have to basically see every doctor that you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> but, um, so it does take a while, but most people, if you can stick with it, you will eventually go. Um, and then from there, you get an invitation. They'll send you training materials, things like that. And then they'll send you a staging date where you will fly. Most of them are out of DC. You'll fly to DC and you'll stay there for three days with the other volunteers in your group, and it'll just be like a very basic orientation. Um, but like I said, most people do eventually go if it's something that they really want to do. Um, and now, it's actually changed a little bit from when I applied, you can select a preferred country, which was crazy. I'm like, what? I want to do this. <laughs> but, um, so do your homework. You know, go, go online to the Peace Corps website, look at all the countries, that they are serving. Um, you can even look up blogs of volunteers serving those countries and just see what their life is like and figure out what's going to be the best fit for you. Um, that's definitely a big thing. I think, I think you can select three preferred countries and they try to get you one. Um, that might set you back more because each country only takes volunteers once a year. So depending on what their, their, their staging date is, it could take longer. Um, for me, it was really fast. I think I from the, from the day I applied to when I left, it was 10 months, which is very fast. It's usually more like a year and a half. I think it just somehow worked out that way. Would you recommend like waiting till you're done with school to do it? Or yes. Apply? Um, I would simply because then you have more to put on your application. Um, you could do it like your last semester or something like that. But you don't want to um, apply when you have a year left in college, and then you get a staging date for you know before you graduate, and you have to say, oh, hold on. Um, but I would wait until you were really ready to go, because it can come at any point after that. And I was kind of late, but I didn't know if you like talked about your personal reasons on why you. No, I didn't actually talk about it. The Peace Corps. Um, no, Peace Corps was something that <coughs> I always kind of wanted to do. I was very curious about it. I'd been planning on doing it probably before I even entered college, um, just because I wanted to go live in another country and kind of experience a different culture, a different language. Um, and then it's been, it's been a very, very rewarding experience to meet all the other volunteers in my group. There were like 34 of us. And I mean, someone, someone who's going to sign up for this, you have a lot of things in common. So it's been a very rewarding thing to kind of go through this process with everyone else. Um, but it was just something I was really interested in doing it. When I heard about it, I thought it sounded crazy, and I was like, sure, why not? Let's go do it. So, um, I would certainly recommend it if you were considering it. It's, it's crazy, but you'll love it. It's, <laughs> it's insane. There are days that you're just going to be like, why in the world did I sign up for this? But then there'll be days that you're just you're absolutely loving it. So, That's great. Yeah, I would certainly recommend it. Yes? Do you have, I'm sure you do, could you share some, like, how your perspectives have changed mm -hmm. from living in a first world country to a first world country right. and coming back? No, definitely. Um, my, my biggest thing is I have so much more patience for people um, because you simply, you have to do it there. You have to wait. You have to wait for people to do things. Um, the kind of the, the, the working lifestyle there is so different. Like I said, I only work 20 hours a week. And you might get something accomplished, you might not. Whereas, you know, here in America, we, we take pride in our jobs. We're like, we're going to do this. We're going to do it by this deadline. It's going to be done at this date. Deadlines are not a thing there. Um, so I definitely had to have much more patience in both my personal and professional lives. Um, I definitely have a bigger um, appreciation for living in America, not just, you know, like the easy things, like, you know, constant water, constant electricity, internet, those kind of things, but just kind of the way that we live and the respect that we have for each other. Uh, I, I get to see um, these huge tensions among, among these different groups in Macedonia, um, and I realized that even though we have some of those things here, but it's not new as much as it is. It doesn't completely alter our lifestyles. Um, and then definitely the way that we treat women here. That's something I've gotten to see that I, I mean, I can't, talk, I can't talk enough about how it's so different. Um, most, most women in Macedonia who are my age are married with multiple children at this point. Um, they probably, 
finish high school, maybe. Um, even if they had a chance to go to university, they would go until they got married. And, the, and then, you know, their sole purpose is to have children and kind of take care of the family unit, which is a very hard job. I mean, they, I can't even describe how hard they work. My house mother wakes up and doesn't stop working until she goes to bed. Um, but it's definitely a life that is very different from what I, from what I have wanted and, you know, what I'm doing. And it's very foreign for them, too, because they see me as this, you know, 24-year-old girl. They're like, why are you here? You need to go to America. You need to get married. You need to have children. Um, you're wasting your time. What are you doing? So just the overall attitude toward women is something that has just been, like, you know, it's constantly there. We constantly see it. And I definitely have much bigger appreciation for my life here as far as that goes. With the Peace Corps, you signed for, like, two years. Is that what you yes. said? It's 27 months altogether. There's three months of training, and then from there you have two years of actual service, is how they call it. Um, how far are you in your service? I am 10 months in, so I still have a year and five months. I will finish up in November of 2015. So, like, I've kind of just gotten to the point now where I figure things out, and, you know, I'm ready to actually do things. <laughs> yeah. Is Peace Corps, would you consider it, like, it, like your job, like oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, I mean, it's completely like it's it, it's a twenty four seven job too, um, because you don't you don't do, you, you can't go home and just be an American again and do what you want. I mean, you have a family. You have to kind of be aware of what they're doing and what they want you to do. Um, and it's something that you don't you don't turn your brain off. You have to keep going, keep going. You should talk about the Mesa fears. Oh, the Mesa fears. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> uh, Mesa fear is an Albanian word, and it's basically for um, visit and you go and you visit family members or neighbors or anything and um, these women it's usually women in, in Albanian communities you know they just wake up and they call each other and like all right we're gonna have coffee at this person's house so we go and they sit there for like 12 hours and I'm just like no no like my, my first weekend my yeah my first weekend my family took me to meet all their all, all of their family their extended family we all gathered at one house and you know, I was like all right I'm gonna meet all these people and of course, my family wanted to show off their brand new American, you know, to see what's happening. And, and I was like, okay, we'll go for a couple hours, it'll be fine, I can come back and, you know, de-stress. And then, no, 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 no. We were there for like 14 hours. <laughs> I had not had a language class at this point. I had my little cheat sheet in my back pocket, and, you know, I'm like, hello, I got nothing else. <laughs> so, and they just sit there, and they talk, and they talk, and they talk, and they drink coffee. The men go to one room, the women go to the other. Uh, and it's completely normal for them. Towards, you know, Americans, if somebody comes to our house for 12 hours, we're just going to be like, it's time for you to leave. <laughs> um, so that was, shoot, that was a big thing. I learned the next weekend that it was time for Sarah to be busy so that Sarah couldn't go to the Mesa Fears. <laughs> and they do the same thing in Macedonia, and they just call it the ghosties. Um, but that's, a, that's something they do for fun. You know, they go and visit with people, um, which is just so crazy for us because, you know, we value privacy. And two hours and we're done. <laughs> but um, it was very intense experience because I had no language at this point. Now I've gotten to where I can at least converse somewhat. Um, you know, I can answer questions that they have because they always have so many questions. I and mean, you're, you're definitely the center of attention when you go on these negotiations because they're so excited to have you. And pictures are taken and everything. Like, you have to be on top of it at all times. <laughs> so I believe I went to one wearing sweatpants and they never stopped talking about it. So I was like, all right, fine. I'll wear jeans next time. I'll do it. But, um, no, that's that's definitely a different different thing. I, I try to get out of those as much as I can at this point. You, you might have mentioned this uh, already. Mm -hmm. What what is your compensation? Oh, um, for a typical uh, yeah. Peace Corps volunteer in Macedonia. Yeah, uh, we get we get what's called like a, a living allowance. It's mm -hmm. enough to live off of. Okay. Um, first of all, our homestay families get paid like for rent and yeah. water, electricity usage, yeah. those things. So like mm -hmm. Peace Corps gives us that money, but then we give that to them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 8,000 den, which would be $160 about that. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a lot of money. $160 uh -huh. per month? Per month, yes. Okay, and then what is your personal allowance? Um, it turns out to be about 10,000 den, which is about $200 a month. Okay, and um, that is enough for you? It's enough to live off of. I okay. mean, you're certainly not going to save money yeah. while you're there. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, I can buy mm -hmm. I can buy what I need, and okay. then I have a little bit more. 
We get like a, a travel allowance if we have to go to the capital, to the office, you know, to see the doctors or things like that. That's all covered. Um, it's certainly enough to live off of. I wouldn't be concerned at all. And, and, and when is the deadline of, of application deadline for that country? Uh, for Macedonia? Mm -hmm. Well, their staging is in September. Um, so I would imagine it would be like a December of the previous year um, application yes. deadline. Okay. But they're constantly accepting okay. applications. So, so basis? Yes. Okay. It's just you might not get the September staging. It might be the next September. Okay. Okay. But there are countries that have different dates. There's one that goes in August, you know, one in July. There's basically a country that stages every month. Um, and that's something you could look at if, if people were going to apply. They could look at the countries and when they had the dates. So they could arrange it to whatever best fit their life at the moment. Very good, thank you. Yeah, but no, they're constantly accepting applications. So there's not really a cutoff date. Did you graduate and then go to Peace Corps or did you work in between? Um, I had about a year in between where I just worked at a school um, in Kentucky and it was kind of, that was my waiting process. I applied, I applied before I graduated. I feel like I applied in maybe November. Um, and then I graduated in December, so, and then I ended up leaving by that following September, but I worked like a semester there, um, just in a school. But, and you work in the library here? Yes. Or you were a student? I was a student worker in the LRC for, I don't know how long. <laughs> Three years. Three years, yeah. something like that, yeah. Yeah. And then when your commitment is up, what are your plans? Um, grad school. At, at some point, I would like to do grad school. Uh, it would be wonderful to be square base for it. They have a few partnership programs with universities um, throughout the country where they'll pay for portions of it if you get your master's degree after, after your Peace Corps service. Um, they have a few programs where you can do it during your Peace Corps service, but I can't imagine trying to do that while I'm doing everything else. I don't know how those volunteers make it. Uh, but yeah, grad school at some point, and then I would like to you know, teach in an American school <laughs> with structure <laughs> and lesson plans. So um, that's the plan for now. Would you do Peace Corps again? I definitely would, uh, especially now that you can like select a preferred country. Man, that's like that's awesome. <laughs> like I would completely do it again. Um, I would do my homework on the on the countries more. I would look at policies and things like that to, you know, find one that was the best fit, mm -hmm. which most of them are going to be about the same. But I would definitely do it again. It might be something I do later on in life. Um, again, we have volunteers of many different ages. I think our oldest volunteers in his 80s and he's 